Hi, he's back for a third time and potentially many more, depending on how ridiculous he gets in future videos. In this video, I'm going to break down the science of Dr. Berg's claims on losing body fat and its relation to insulin. If you're new here, I'm not a random dude. I'm a PhD student in molecular medicine. I hold my master's in exercise physiology, and I spent three years working in a metabolism laboratory. Maybe that still makes me a random dude to you, die-hard Dr. Berg fans. And if you are one, I'd encourage you click off of the video now because what's coming up next isn't pretty. However, assuming you're open-minded to actual science and admittedly a bit of unnecessary sarcastic humor, I welcome you with open arms and thank you for sticking it out. Let's get into it. Learn Your Body, a science-based education. So, Dr. Berg is going to make the argument that insulin is responsible for why you aren't losing fat. I'm going to annihilate that argument as simply and cleanly as I can for your edification. In fairness, I will also point out when he gets things correct. Hey guys, Dr. Berg here. Listen, I have a question. How many times have you attempted to lose weight and it didn't work out? How many failures do you have in the area of weight loss? Once, twice, a hundred? As we age, it becomes more difficult to lose weight. If your metabolism is stuck and you plateaued, I need your undivided attention because I'm going to show you a completely different way to approach weight loss. And this is going to change the course of your attempts. To begin, he starts out by saying that as we age, it becomes more difficult to lose weight and then adds that maybe your metabolism is stuck. According to the research, which I will have linked for you, basal metabolic rate, the biggest part of our metabolism, reduces by one to 2% every 10 years. So if your basal metabolic rate is 2000 calories a day, it would drop by 40 calories every 10 years. So if that begins at the ripe old age of 20 and continues to the ripe old age of 80, your metabolism will have decreased to around 1,750 calories over 60 years. That's only a 250 calorie drop. Maybe after 60 years you'd notice, but going from 20 to 30 or 30 to 40, that's a tiny decrease. So your actual baseline metabolism, known as your basal metabolic rate, doesn't change as drastically as he'd have you believe. The one way metabolism does decrease is through lack of physical activity, which accounts for about 20% of our total metabolism. When you're 20, you're usually moving a lot more, if that's sports or in general life, compared to when you're 40. Yet, if you consume an equal amount or more per day as when you were active, you are effectively gaining weight insidiously, and it isn't your metabolism's fault. But this is alterable, however. So let's continue. You need a happy ending to the struggles. All I want is for you to be willing to learn something new. And all I want is for you to learn something correct. Now I'm gonna show you the secret, but I need your full attention. If you checked out, Check back in right now because this is vital. So the hormone that stops you from losing weight is called insulin. A lot of people know this as relating to diabetes, but it has another function, a huge function, and it is the hormone that puts fat not only on your body, but mainly your midsection. It also prevents you from losing weight. It's called the fat storage hormone. And here's what people don't realize. In the presence of even a tiny little bit of insulin, all fat burning hormones are shut down. What does that mean? It means that if you were to consume half a glass of juice, a glass of wine, a bagel, even a piece of fruit, if you have a problem with this hormone, you're not gonna lose weight for the next 48 hours. So when you see someone with belly fat, you can be 100% sure that that person has too much insulin. So the insulin goes up, a person gains weight. When the insulin goes down, they lose the weight. Let's just look at this book called Guyton's Physiology, the authority medical book in every medical school. All aspects of fat metabolism are greatly enhanced in the absence of insulin. 
So we need to create an absence of insulin to lose weight. Now he's getting into the cause of why you can't lose weight. Insulin, or as he says it, insulin, as if you're a toddler. Don't worry, I know you're an intelligent adult. He's right here though. Insulin is a primary hormone that encourages fat cells to store fat molecules, making you potentially fatter. But we'll see where this generalized understanding breaks down in just a bit. Insulin overall does not prevent you from losing weight, however. And this idea that a tiny bit of insulin shuts down all weight or fat loss is laughable, especially for this arbitrary 48 hours he espouses. Where did that come from? I have no idea, but it's patently false. He mentions a series of carbohydrate-rich foods that do spike insulin. That bears out in the literature. However, did you know that fat and protein also stimulate insulin? So if insulin is increased by all the nutrients we eat, uh, that would mean you'd have to fast to lose weight and fat mass. And before the fasting enthusiasts rub their hands together and mutter, good, good, like evil geniuses under their breath, we know many different diets lead to fat loss. So clearly the idea that a tiny bit of insulin shuts down all fat loss is ludicrous. Insulin, as with any hormone, is not an on and off proposition. You should be thinking of hormones as dimmer switch. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. We'll discuss all of this further after he says this. Based on the information on insulin, you can predict what diet is going to work and which one is not. So if you took the Atkins diet or Weight Watchers or Paleo or Vegan or Ketogenic, the question is, does any of these lower insulin? Those are the ones that are going to work. Insulin is the switch that determines whether you burn fat or you make fat. Okay, so he says that you should look at varying diets and understand which ones lower insulin and then you won't gain fat. He's setting us up nicely for you to come to the conclusion that the ketogenic diet is the right choice because it's largely devoid of carbohydrates that stimulate insulin. Unfortunately, the ketogenic diet, as I mentioned earlier, also stimulates insulin. Maybe not as much, but it still does, refuting his earlier points. The question is, however, does a ketogenic diet lead to more weight or fat loss considering its lower insulin levels compared to a high carbohydrate diet? If this turns out to be false, this would be a gaping hole in Dr. Berg's overall point. As a matter of fact, if the high carbohydrate group lost any weight or fat, this would disprove his insulin argument. However, looking at studies that compare high carbohydrate diets to low carbohydrate diets, a high carbohydrate diet does show higher insulin levels than a low carbohydrate group. And yet there is no statistical difference between the two diets in weight loss or fat loss. But to be clear, I'm not saying a ketogenic diet can't work. It does, but that isn't the argument he's making. The argument is that high carbohydrate diets can't work for reducing body fat because of the elevated insulin. And that simply isn't true, as we see since the high carb groups do lose body weight and body fat. Not only that, you see that insulin levels are still present. They aren't zero and people still lose weight and body fat, regardless of diet. Finally, although no studies in humans have shown this because no one has investigated it, I'd bet my non-existent hat that if you found people's maintenance metabolism calories and told them to consume 500 calories over that maintenance, but only in fat and protein, keeping their insulin lower, they would still gain fat. This is proven true in animal studies, but I won't use that as a real line of evidence, although I believe it to be true for humans as well. Let's move on from this massacre into our final battlefield. So the next question is, what lowers insulin? Here are the things. Number one, carbohydrates. Now you probably already know this, that low carb diets are very, very healthy. So you wanna cut the sugar out, you wanna cut the hidden sugars out. That does include the breads, pasta, cereal, crackers, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, muffins, sodas, juice, alcohol, flavored yogurts, fruits, okay? Most people know that, some people don't. Well, aside from us just nullifying the overall argument that insulin is the reason you can't lose fat, let's just go along and touch on each point. First, cutting carbs reduces insulin. Yep, 
He's right here. We even saw that in the study I showed you. Number two, avoid combining protein with sugar. So if you were gonna to go to a restaurant and order a breaded piece of meat, or maybe it's a hot and sweet sour chicken, you know, from a Chinese restaurant, or like a hamburger with the bun, or a hamburger with the fries, or a hamburger with the Coke, that will greatly spike insulin way more than if you eat these separated, okay? Number three, and this is, this is, this is one that people don't realize, lean, low-fat proteins trigger insulin more than fattier proteins. So if you were gonna buy like a burger, like some burger meat, and you had 95% versus 85%, and there's more fat, I would go for the fattier meat because fat tends to buffer insulin. Lean protein, specifically protein powders like whey protein, that will spike insulin more. That's a new one. Next one, excessive protein. Large amounts of protein convert to insulin. So the ideal amount of protein is between three to six ounces. As for the combination of protein and carbs, while he's correct that they both increase insulin, as we discussed, but there's more nuance here that he's ignoring. The type of protein, the fat content in the meal, the intestinal absorption, there's definitely other factors that change the insulinogenic response by the body. Next, I'll knock these two out together. Lean protein stimulates insulin, that's true. Excess protein stimulates insulin, that's true. Fat does not buffer the insulin response. It also stimulates insulin, just less so. Okay, I hope you're taking notes. Next one, MSG, monosodium glutamate. What is that? That is a chemical that enlarges your taste buds to make the food taste more savory, to make it more delicious than it really is. All the fast food places uh, have MSG in their, their food. Uh, Peruvian chicken, they put MSG, like a ton of it. And so there's MSG in so many foods in the grocery store. But here's the problem, it spikes insulin by 200%. Yeah, I know. So here you are, you consume this food, it tastes really, really good, but then all of a sudden you notice the next day you just gained a bunch of weight because it spikes insulin. Okay, this MSG comment is another example of a person trying to scare without contextualizing. Sometimes I wonder if people just stop caring about fact-checking what they say or if they just say stuff and hope it sticks. According to the science, MSG does increase insulin secretion in animals and in human studies. So he's right there, but not by this elusive 200%. Where does that even come from? The human studies were done with the consumption of many grams of MSG, 10 grams in this study. Technically, the study found no significant increase, so that 200% number is non-existent. But assuming it did slightly elevate insulin levels, do you know how much MSG the average person consumes? Half a gram, maybe a gram. So at 10 to 20 times that amount, the researchers were barely able to tell a difference, yet now you're going to get shredded by removing your half a gram of MSG from your diet. You can miss me with that. Yet, I can already feel people misrepresenting my argument. So, let me go ahead and state that I am not saying that MSG is good for your health, but I am saying that dose absolutely matters. And assuming increases in insulin is the reason you can't lose weight, which it isn't, cutting out MSG won't do anything to improve that reality. Also, MSG enlarges your taste buds? No, that's not how the body works, but I digress. Next one is stress. So I wrote a book on body types. So the adrenal body type is the one with the belly fat, and that's triggered by cortisol. That's a stress hormone. But here's the thing. Cortisol doesn't increase the belly fat directly. It works through insulin. So stress increases insulin. Look, I'm starting to get tired of the blatant inaccuracies, but you literally cannot be more wrong. I'll keep it simple. He says, cortisol is a stress hormone and it increases insulin. That is completely incorrect. These researchers literally put cortisol on the insulin producing cells and they reduced their insulin secretion. 
I don't know how much more cut and dry I can make this. Plus, I love the quasi answer of just saying cortisol works through insulin. The questions are one, is that true? No. And two, how, Dr. Berg? Explain the physiology because the experiments show the exact opposite. Okay, bear with me. We're almost done. Okay. And lastly, too frequent meals, too frequently eating. If you eat too frequently, like five to six times a day versus two or three times a day, that's gonna spike insulin. Why? Because eating in general increases insulin. I know. It doesn't even matter what you eat. It's spiking insulin. So if you're grazing at night or snacking between meals, you're spiking insulin. So that's gonna create, that's a hidden source of higher levels of insulin. And finally, do too frequent of meals increase insulin? I've covered this before, and the answer is no. If the same amount of food is consumed in fewer meals or in many meals, the total insulin release over a 24-hour period is the exact same. Here's the data for that. Look, I get that if you're a Dr. Berg fan, even though you should have clicked off this video already, as I mentioned, this wasn't going to be pretty. You want to defend your guy. That's fair, he's likable. But please don't deny the science. He's simply wrong. He can be a nice guy. You can still get results doing the things he says, but the science explanations he offers are complete bunk. So I encourage you not to look to him as an authority to teach you on the reality of your body. I get extremely frustrated when I show data and offer detailed scientific explanations and people just scream back, he's just simplifying concepts, you egghead. He might be trying to do that in the best case scenario, but he just doesn't have a clue what he's explaining and simplifying the wrong information is still wrong information. All right, with that, I hope you learned a thing or two. If you'd like to keep up with my Spotlight series, feel free to keep watching my other critiques. I do try and keep them fair, and I'll hopefully have the pleasure of speaking with you in the next one. Cheers.